And this evening we will focus our meditation upon John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. And you have this printed on page 5. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. And one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus, Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. This is the gospel of our Lord. Et tu, Brute? No, I'm not speaking in tongues. That is one of the better known lines, probably the best known line, from Shakespeare's work, Julius Caesar. Now, whether or not Caesar actually said those words when he was ambushed by those, by those Roman senators on that infamous Ides of March, well, that's something that I guess is debated by historians. But it makes sense to think that of all the, the daggers that were plunged into Caesar by those senators who, who were leery of Caesar's ambition and thought he was a threat to their Roman Republic, well, of all those daggers that were plunged into him, probably the one that hurt Caesar the most was the one that was in the hand of his good, dear friend, Marcus Brutus. And so it makes for a powerful scene. After Caesar had been stabbed several times, he, he staggers over to the arms of Brutus, and he falls into the arms of, of his good friend, appealing to him for help, only to find out that Brutus has a dagger in his hand as well. And in disbelief, Caesar then utters those last words, et tu, Brute, meaning, even you, Brutus? Is there anything more stinging than betrayal? You know, we expect enemies to hurt us, to wrong us, but good friends and family members, from them we expect loyalty, Right? And so when someone who we are close to, someone who we trust with our deepest secrets, someone who we thought we could trust, when they betray that trust, it is incredibly painful. A betrayal, it, it burns like the sun. It, it scalds the soul. Well, Judas was certainly close to Jesus. Judas was a part of, of Jesus' inner circle, one of his chosen 12 disciples. They had spent so much time together the past three years. They, they broke bread together. And now, this evening, well, we are focused on his hands of betrayal. And in fact, what do we know Judas for? We don't know him as one of the disciples other than knowing him as the disciple who betrayed the Lord. That's all he's known for is his betrayal. Have you ever met anybody named Brutus? I'm guessing you, you probably haven't because that's not really a name that parents are just passing out to their children. It's a name that is synonymous with betrayal because that's what he is, the betrayer. But how could, Brutus, or how, how could Judas do that? How could he betray his Lord? I mean, think about that. He had spent all that time with Jesus. He had heard Jesus' teachings. He had witnessed Jesus' miracles. He had been there with Jesus through all of it. There was only 11 other men that could claim to be as close to Jesus as Judas was. So what happened? What changed in him? And when exactly did that take place? Was there a, a switch that was suddenly flipped and all of a sudden Judas went to the dark side? Or, or would we say that that Judas was just from the very get-go, from the moment of his birth, was uniquely wicked and vile. 
Well, to say that Judas was uniquely wicked and vile from the beginning probably isn't very accurate. At least he was no more than everyone else who was born in this world in sin. But, but consider the fact that at one point in time, Judas had heeded Jesus' invitation to follow him. Judas could say, like Peter and all the other apostles, Jesus, we left everything behind to follow you. Consider the fact that Judas, he had gone on missionary journeys. He had served right alongside with all of the other disciples. So what happened? How could he go from that to now betraying the Son of God? And is there a lesson for us to be learned from Judas's hands that went from serving and assisting in gospel ministry to accepting money to betray his Lord? Well, Scripture does indicate to us that for a while, Judas had struggled with greed in his heart. So earlier on in this evening, as we read that, that passion history, we read that account of that woman bringing that, that perfume to Jesus, to, to anoint Jesus with. It was, a, it was a beautiful act, a beautiful thing. It was actually Mary that had done that, that to anoint Jesus with that, that perfume. And Jesus commends her for it. And then we hear the disciples, they criticize her for it. Because they said that that expensive perfume, it could have been sold and they could have used the money to help the poor. Well, the Gospel of John tells us that it was actually Judas who instigated that criticism. But the Holy Spirit lets us in on what's actually going on in Judas's heart. The, the Gospel of John tells us, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, this love of money was a terrible temptation for Judas. And worst of all, the devil knew it. And so he kept flying that, that flag, and he kept waving that temptation in front of Judas like a flag, knowing, his, knowing his, his susceptibility to it, knowing he would fall for it. And think about it, once, once the devil had gotten Judas to dip his dirty hands into the disciples' petty cash and use it as his own personal piggy bank, well, it really wasn't that much more of a leap for the devil to ask Judas, and what exactly would you be willing to do for 30 pieces of silver? No, there wasn't a switch that was flipped, and all of a sudden Judas went to the dark side. Nor was Judas uniquely vile and wicked from birth, that, that from the moment he was born, he was predetermined to betray the Lord. No, that's not the case. What really happened was that unchecked, unrepentant, garden-variety greed overtook his heart. And as it overtook his soul, it corrupted his faith, it corrupted him until finally he was able to carry out this full treachery. Our lesson tells us the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Evidently, Judas's double life had fooled all the rest of the disciples. Right? They all still saw him as a friend, as an ally. Nobody saw the, the greed that he allowed to run amok in his heart. Nobody saw it or suspected anything. That is, of course, but for Jesus. And Jesus chose the, the Passover meal before instituting the Lord's Supper as this time to reveal his betrayer. Our lesson says, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Now, as we would imagine, this accusation from Jesus, it brought instant tension into the room. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that, that one right after another, the disciples said to each other, Surely not I, Lord, not me. And maybe, maybe we can understand the disciples' response as being one of, of, of defense, right? They were, they were deflecting and denying. And maybe we could understand it as being a little bit of overconfidence in self. As if they were saying, surely not I, Lord, because I wouldn't be capable of such a thing. Not me, Lord, I would never betray you. And maybe that response, it reminds us a little bit of Peter's response 
When Jesus told Peter that, that he would deny him three times, do you remember Peter's response? Peter said, not me, Jesus. I would never do that. I would die for you if need be. Of course, we all know how that turned out. So it could have been overconfidence, pride in self that led the disciples to say this, but there's another way to understand it. These accusations, this charge from Jesus, it might have led these disciples to do some soul searching. And so that question, surely not I, Lord, may have been one of self-doubt. They knew Jesus could look in their hearts and souls. They may have been thinking to themselves, Jesus knows all. Clearly Jesus sees something in one of our hearts that no one else sees. What does he see in my heart? Am I capable of this? Well, are you? Or what sins are you capable of? Or what sins do we have hiding in our heart? Right, is, is greed the sin that is crouching at your door? Or is it lust or envy, maybe anger or, or hatred? Or what are the sins that, that you fight so hard to keep hidden to yourself, but that the devil waves in your face like a flag because he knows they can bring you to your knees? And I think it's an important question for us to answer honestly. Because if all we take out of this account and out of this devotion is that Judas was a really bad guy, well, that doesn't really help us any. You know, I asked at the beginning of the devotion, you know, what lesson can we learn from this tragic downfall of Judas? What can we take from this? Well, I think one lesson that we can learn is to say that anyone is capable of any sin, especially when sin is allowed to go unchecked in the heart. Sin that goes unchecked, unanswered, unrepentant of the heart, it destroys faith, it corrupts the soul. And so what sin would Jesus see in our hearts? And more importantly, do we repent of those sins? Or do we join the chorus of those saying, surely not I, Lord. Well, that accusation from Jesus, it just kind of hung uncomfortably in the air for some time. And as the disciples scramble trying to deflect the blame, the attention away from themselves, and finally, Peter, he nudges John, who's sitting next to him, because John is sitting next to Jesus. And Peter tells John, ask Jesus who he's talking about. Right? Who is the betrayer? And the lesson says, Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. We see such loving care for Judas, Jesus' disciple, that Jesus showed him. Earlier, as Jesus was teaching the, the people and he was teaching them, the crowds, about, about the dangers of greed, about warnings against the love of money, yes, he was talking to the crowd, but of course he was also talking to Judas. He was also preaching to Judas' heart. And now at the 11th hour, as things are getting late, it seems as though now Jesus is changing his tactic a little bit. It seems like, like Jesus is trying to, to jar Judas's conscience, to dislodge this, dislodge this greedy grip that sin has on his own soul. And so now Jesus starts calling out Judas publicly to let him know, Judas, this sin is not as secret as you think it is. I know what you're doing. Don't go through with it. In fact, we know of three times at least in Scripture, that Jesus publicly called out Judas in the presence of the twelve. The first time was after Jesus' uh, bread of life discourse. And then he said to Jesus, or he said to the, the twelve, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And if that's not enough to wake you up, I don't know what is. And then earlier on this same night, when they were in that upper room together, after Jesus had washed his disciples' feet, he said, You are clean, though not every one of you. That's time number two. And then finally, the third time is as they were celebrating the Passover meal together. Again, Jesus identifies Judas as the betrayer, giving him that final warning, Don't do it. Resist Satan. Don't go through with it. 
even to his betrayer, we see Jesus showing love and compassion to the very end. But of course, we know Judas did choose to walk down that path of betrayal. And later on this very same night, Judas would betray Jesus to his captors with a kiss. Well, Jesus would walk down another path to another betrayal of sorts. Jesus would go to the cross where he would cry out in anguished pain to a faithful friend who had abandoned him. He would cry out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Of course, the Father abandoned the Son because God was treating Christ as though he had committed Judas' act of betrayal. He abandoned him because he was treating Jesus and punishing Jesus as though he had committed that heinous treachery. And in fact, more than that, the Father abandoned the Son to suffer the punishment of hell on the cross because he was being treated and being punished for all of our sins. He was getting what our sins deserve. He was being punished for all of our greed, for all of our idolatrous love of money, for all of our shameful sins that that, that we refuse to acknowledge, that we strive to keep hidden. He was punished for all of them. He received the punishment in full. That is why he was abandoned. But because he was punished in full, now we know we are forgiven in full. As Isaiah writes, by his wounds, we are healed. You know, with this vile and treachery of Judas, doesn't the grace and love and power of our God just shine forth just that much more? Because we see how, how God took this, this evil betrayal and how he used it for good. In fact, we could say he used it for the greatest good. The Lord took that, that greed and betrayal that the devil had worked in Judas's heart and he turned it around to destroy the devil. Because through that betrayal, Jesus went to the cross. To the cross where Jesus won forgiveness for an entire world trapped in sin, including Judas. Now that does not at all justify or excuse Judas' actions, of course. But what it does do is it magnifies the love and power of our God. Even in the deepest darkness of sin in this world, our God is still in control of this world. And he is still eager to forgive. One final point, one lesson that we can take from this, this story, this example of Judas. One final point, I think, is to say that even Judas... Right? Even Judas was still loved by Jesus, and even Judas was forgiven. And by that I mean that Jesus went to the cross to pay for Judas's sins. Jesus suffered Judas' punishment on the cross. Now, tragically, of course, we know that in unbelief, Judas rejected that forgiveness. He refused that it could be true. He rejected it, and he was so distraught by his own betrayal that Judas reasoned that the only thing God could do would be to treat him in kind. And so in despairing unbelief, Judas ended his own life. But here's the thing is, it kind of made sense for Judas to feel that way, didn't it? I mean, really, isn't that what makes sense? Isn't it what makes sense that, that God would turn his back on us for all of our sins by which we betray him. Isn't that the sensible thing? But of course, the thing is, the gracious message of the gospel has never really been sensible. It has never been the sensible thing. The message of the gospel is the message that God does not turn his back on us for our sins. Instead, he turned his back on his son. He forsook Christ, and he reconciled a sinful world to himself. And so banish the thought that God would ever banish you for your sins. And don't let Satan or anyone or anything in this world tell you otherwise. Because there is no sin so great. There is no betrayal so incredibly appalling. And there is no secret sin so shameful that God could not forgive it. And in fact, in Christ, he already has. 
Amen.